What are the common misconceptions of these neurotransmitters slash hormones and, and what roles do they actually uh, uh, play in shaping our behavior? Great. And you're absolutely right to say the slash because it used to be testosterone only belonged to the endocrinologists, but then it's doing something neurotransmitterish in the brain and dopamine used to only belong to the neurochemist. So yeah, it's on a continuum, of course. Um, testosterone, everybody knows exactly what testosterone is about, which is the hormone that makes you aggressive. It explains why males the world over and species after species are such pains in the asses because testosterone causes aggression. Testosterone does not cause aggression. What testosterone does mostly is it amplifies, it increases the volume on the aggression that's already there, the aggression that's been socially learned. And that's a very different story. You know, a perfect example of it, you take five male monkeys, they've formed a dominance hierarchy. Number one trashes two through five, two trashes three through five, all of that. So you take number three in the hierarchy and shoot him up with testosterone, shoot him up with like so much of it, like he's, he's growing antlers or something. And does he get in more fights? Absolutely. Whoa, testosterone causes aggression. But what you might speculate at that point is as a result of that testosterone, number three is suddenly like confronting numbers two and one and maybe toppling the, nah, you never see that. He still is just as brown nosing with them as he used to be. All that happens is he's become a total nightmare to numbers four and five. All the testosterone has done is amplify the social learning that was there already. One and two, you have to pretend you like their like haircuts. Four and five, you can do anything you want to. So let's do it 10 times as much as normal. Testosterone doesn't cause aggression. Testosterone amplifies what's already been socially learned. And testosterone even more so is about defending challenges to your status, but then humans have come up all sorts of circumstances where defending your status does not involve aggression. Just look at a bunch of rich, half drunk people at a, you know, a charity auction and they're competing for status over who could give away the most money conspicuously. That one doesn't make a whole lot of sense when testosterone is all about aggression. And in studies where people get status by being more generous, you give people testosterone and they become more generous. Mm -hmm. It's not about making you aggressive. It's a making about amplifying whatever you've learned is good for holding on to status in your little sliver of the universe. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. And how we get status in our culture is we're probably going to have to change away from conspicuous consumption, et cetera. So testosterone will play a role. Exactly. And I mean, what that tells us at the end of the day with like human aggression, testosterone isn't the problem. The problem is that we hand out so damn much social status for aggression. That's that's the thing that needs to be solved. And as you know, that's immediately intertwined with who's got how many toys and how conspicuously can you display it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we may not be economically rational, but we are economically competitive and testosterone just feeds into that in ways no other ape can make sense of. And what about dopamine? Dopamine totally great, exciting neurotransmitter. Um, another one where everybody knows what dopamine is about, um, which is dopamine is about reward. It's about pleasure. Um, cocaine works on the dopamine system, various euphorians. You like give somebody cocaine and they're releasing a thousand fold more dopamine than like some key parts of the brain ever do. And whoa, it's amazing. Dopamine is about reward. It's about pleasure. And superficially, it seems that way. You take a, a person or a monkey or a rat and you give them a reward from completely out of nowhere and they have a rush of dopamine. Yeah, that's great. 
then you look more closely. And what you do is you take a paradigm and it works this way in a human or a monkey or a rat. You like train the individual that, okay, we put you in a room and as soon as the little light comes on, it means every time you press this lever 10 times, you're going to get a little reward. Signal, work, reward, signal, work, reward. So the organism learns that, uh, the, the college freshman in Psych 101 or the lab or whatever, and they learn this. So you put them in the situation, the light comes on, they do the work and they get the reward. When did dopamine rise? And if dopamine is just about reward, it rises after you get the reward. That's not what you see. It rises when the little light comes on. What's that about? That's you sitting there saying, yeah, I'm all over this. I know about this lever pressing stuff. This is going to be great. I'm like completely master of the universe at this lever pressing. Dopamine isn't about reward as much as it's about the anticipation of reward. And we sure know endless ways in life in which the anticipation turned out to be better than the actual thing. And most importantly, if you block dopamine from being released at that time, you don't get the lever pressing. It's about the anticipation and it's about the motivation and the goal directed behavior that's generated by that anticipation is at part of the core of our, our current super organism, energy hungry dynamic of human society. Absolutely. And a weird human specific feature of the dopamine system explains, you know, if you want to be grandiose, 99% of what's going wrong with this, which is like, you're a baboon. What are your sources of pleasure in life? You, you get to hassle somebody lower ranking than you, you get to have sex, you're hungry and you eat something good. That, that's about it. Like if you're human, all of those things feel good, but also like solving Fermat's last theorem feels good. And like reading about, you know, acts of random kindness on the, uh, and seeing an arousing scene in a movie involving characters who aren't even real and listening to a symphony and and smelling a flower in early in spring and all of that, we've got a system that has to incorporate responding to rewarding things that range from like remembering a line of poetry to quadruple orgasms. And the only way you can get a dopamine system that could handle that large of a range is it's got to reset quickly. What about oxytocin? Okay. Oxytocin, it's the grooviest hormone on earth. Oxytocin is about love and trust and, and social intelligence and all of that. Oxytocin is this amazing hormone. Best evidence is it's about a hundred million years old. And what it first evolved for was like the most basic thing that mammals were getting around to doing, which was making mothers get attached to their kids and kids attached to their mothers, which is really essential if you're going to do that mammal dependent on mom stuff. So that's been around for about a hundred million years. Best evidence is about 30, 20 million years ago. It then got, you know, refigured and started being used as well for pair bonding, uh, you know, monogamy. And it's just a tiny percentage of social mammals that are monogamous, but they make heavy use of uh, oxytocin. And whether we are one of those species is a really interesting topic in and of itself because we're not, but we're kind of a little bit and we're very confused. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe in the last 5 million years, um, oxytocin then got reconfigured again for things like trust and social cooperation and generosity and game theory settings and all of that. Here's the nuttiest thing we've done with oxytocin, this hundred million year old hormone. And in the last 20,000 years, we've reconfigured it again so that we secrete it and our dogs secrete it when we're looking into each other's eyes. Like, whoa, we're now using oxytocin for feeling attached to our ex-wolves. Like, 
20,000 years, a blink of an eye, and now we use it for that. And you give a dog oxytocin and it looks at its human longer. Okay, so everything about oxytocin there is great. And if we could just dump oxytocin in the water supply, this would be a wonderful planet. Oxytocin promotes prosociality. It doesn't. Oxytocin promotes prosociality with people who you consider to be an us people like me and your pet dog who you spend more on for food each year than your Sudanese gets in a decade um, counts as an us. What does oxytocin do when you're encountering thems? It makes you crappier to them. It makes you more preemptively aggressive. It makes you less trustworthy. Oxytocin doesn't make you nice. It makes you nice to people who already count as a you, and it makes you awful to them. It just takes this us, them, like fracture line we have in our heads, and it just pushes it apart further. And amazing studies showing you give people oxytocin, and they become more cooperative to their team members, and they become awful to the people on the other team. It it is not this groovy hormone. It is this hormone that makes parochial, you know, provinciality more dramatic. And that's not often a good thing.